Well, thank you very much uh, for inviting us to come and talk here. I think the, it's been a wonderful afternoon so far, and I've really enjoyed the few uh, talks uh, that there have been. So I was asked to talk uh, about uh, the JLA process, the James Lind Alliance process, and how this facilitated our partnership with researchers and also, uh, well, uh, uh, and that. And so, uh, believe it or not, that's what I'm going to try and do. So what is a priority setting partnership? It's a way whereby uh, part a, a partnership between clinicians and patients uh, can be asked to identify the research agenda for the affliction that they're concerned with. And although I'm going to give a general talk about the, uh, the James Lind Alliance PSPs, uh, necessarily I'm going to talk about it with relationship to cavernoma. So I thought I'd start with cavernoma. But the idea is that you produce a list of what are known as uncertainties, and by uncertainties you mean uh, it's a question to which it is known that the answer is unknown. And we get into Donald Rumsfeld, we're not careful. Uh, but, uh, but it's that fact that it's the idea that it doesn't have a known answer yet, and so they're called uncertainties, although we often talk about research questions. So what is a PS, what is, well, sorry, excuse me, what is a cavernoma? A cavernoma uh, is uh, what I've called a bloody cavern in the brain. My wife told me not to use that term, but to say it's an abnormal collection of blood vessels. Now I've done one better than the speakers so far, because they've brought along photographs of their patients, I've brought along the patients. So the patient with this uh, cavernoma is my wife, Pat, who told me not to say what I've just said. Uh, and uh, so it impacts on the nervous tissue of the brain, uh, and the, it, the uh, symptoms are neurological in, in basis. And the symptoms depend upon their location. So this cavernoma is fairly obvious in the temporal lobe, uh, and that caused uh, Pat to have epilepsy, excuse me, uh, have epilepsy, which was how it was diagnosed, I'm getting confused with this, uh, and in her case it was very fortunate because it was fairly near the surface of the brain, and so she no longer has that one, that was removed new, uh, with uh, surgery uh, about four or five years ago. And so if it's elsewhere in the brain, and here's uh, the second patient I brought along, uh, this is in the, nerve, uh, in the brainstem of Ian here, who found it in CAUK, and his uh, symptoms are totally different. Uh, slurred speech, difficulty in walking, he has tremor on his right side, and double vision. You wouldn't know it to talk to him any of that, uh, but he does. And uh, in his case, it's impossible to remove that. Well, it's possible to remove it, but extremely dangerous in the brainstem, and so uh, surgeons don't, don't remove them in that case. It's a rare in the symptomatic form. Uh, many people have cavernoma and not know it because the, the symptoms can be so minor that you don't ever find out about it. And so several people here could have cavernoma and not know it. But as soon as you get symptoms, it becomes rare. And about 25% or 30% are genetic. Now, it's not known how to treat cavernoma. That's not quite true. A lot of treatments are given for cavernoma, but there's no good evidence as to what is the best way to treat cavernoma. And Ian, several years ago, did a study with people from elsewhere, clinicians and so on, which I tried to identify what was known about the evidence, and the answer was there was almost no evidence about how to do it. And so recently, uh, we, Cavernoma Alliance, undertook a James Lind Alliance Priority Setting Partnership, which is JLA, PSP, or just PSP down the rest of my talk, uh, in order to identify what uh, were the questions, what were the uncertainties which needed answering. Now, uh, uh, I'm sorry, my mind is going completely wrong. Sarah, in her talk, I'm sorry, uh, in her talk, uh, talked about how people funded research and how people who did research tried to get funding. The point about the JLA PSP is that the people who know what research should be done, as indeed Sarah referred to, are the patients and the clinicians. The patients have a great deal of evidence, as she said. And so, uh, how can we find out what uh, clinicians and patients identify as the important research questions? Because if you're going to do that, you need to make sure that people know about it, and to make people know about it, they need to have confidence that you've got the best answers. In particular, if you're NIHR or if you're the MRC or the Wellcome Trust going to fund research, you want to know that the questions are the ones that are worth, worth having. And so you want to get them onto a list which is recognized as an authority and that 
until December was held by what's called UK Duets, is now held by the James Lind Alliance uh, and on, on a database that is held within uh, NIHR. And so uh, the James Lind Alliance was formed to provide the framework of what I'm going to describe. Uh, it's a, an organization, it's hosted by the NIHR, it's in Southampton University, and by setting uh, procedures, it gives that quality assurance I was talking about. Originally, it was very concerned with clinical care and treatment. Uh, primarily, it was very difficult to get them to allow you to do things more than that. We were very concerned in Cabernoma Alliance that we could go broader. We wanted to do treatment and care, but we also wanted to do other things such as prognosis, diagnosis, and so on. And so the, uh, the idea is you do this partnership, I'll talk about it, and the end result is meant to be a list of 10 prioritized list of uncertainties, which then get made public, uh, so that you can then go to researchers, you can go to funders, and say, please, would you start funding this kind of research? Uh, and uh, is that, well, I think that's really what that slide says. Uh, so, the interested parties in research are clinicians, are patients, researchers, and they can be applied, or Blue Sky, university, they can be commercial organizations, but the JLSP works with clinicians and patients only. It won't take onto its bodies, onto its steering group, or such like, uh, the researchers themselves, it's meant to be independent of those, or indeed it won't take on the commercial organisations. Uh, okay, so, so, so what happens? Well, first of all, you have to approach uh, the James Lind Alliance and say, I'd like to become uh, a priority setting partnership. And in their, our case, they tried to dissuade us and say, why do you want to do it? And we said, reasons why we wanted to do it uh, were basically because it gave the quality to the output that we would receive. There were some side issues which were very beneficial I mentioned at the end. Now it costs quite a lot of money to run a PSP. Uh, they say before we'll take you on you've got to raise 25k. Now to many organisations 25k might be able to be found quite easily. At that stage the budget of, uh, of Cavanoma Alliance was about 25k a year. That was a problem. It's now quite a bit more, but that's uh, in the recent years. So it took us uh, a bit of time to raise 25K, and so we went back and said, we've got it. So then we formed a steering group uh, and created a protocol. This was all before you really get going. So we raised 25K. Why do you need 25,000 pounds? And the answer is, you have to pay a project manager who's appointed by JLA, and ours cost 5,000 pounds, Ian beat them down from a bit higher. Uh, we had to uh, pay an information specialist and we got ours for 4,500. That position is totally critical. Whether you work through the PSP properly or not depends absolutely critically on having someone able to do all that kind of analysis. And we were very fortunate we got someone who'd been chief statistician at NHS Scotland, just retired, wondered what he was going to do and we were very fortunate to get him. We paid as an administrator, administration costs, and then we paid various meeting costs. And in the end, we produced a publication, which is uh, available on the web, which is this. Uh, and uh, that cost us just over 20,000, so we saved a little bit. But that was why you need the money. Uh, then we formed a steering group, and the steering group has on it clinicians, it has patients, it has carers, it had uh, CA UK as a charity, it also had Brain and Spine as a charity. Many organizations, many PSPs have many more charities than that, but not researchers are not industry, and you meet from time to time, obviously. And you create a protocol, and the protocol says, what are you going to do, how are you going to do it, who's going to do it, what are you going to do with it when you've got it, what else are you going to do with it later, for all fairly obvious kind of things. It puts it rather differently to that, that was my shorthand. So, what is the JLA process? And the JLA process is first of all to go out in consultation and gather questions. And you're going to gather questions from anybody who's interested in providing them. They're called uncertainties, but you're going to go to all our members in the UK, all the conditions we could get hold of. Uh, we approached a whole kind of set of organizations to say, would you please uh, provide information to that clinicians through the various professional bodies and so on. And you say to them, please provide questions, and we provided a survey uh, and, uh, uh, which said, uh, would you provide questions? We said what, what types of questions we wanted. 
Uh, if you want to find out what we ask, in this, this document on the web, the web-based version is good in the sense it's got links to a web, -based, a web uh, resource behind this publication, and it's got our surveys, it's, it's got masses of information. We laid everything bare in there. Most of it's fairly obvious. Uh, one uh, Excel spreadsheet, I couldn't face explaining how to use it, and it says, if you want to use it, by all means do so, but talk to me first, which you will not understand it without. But it's a good resource, he says. So, consultation, uh, and so what happened in the consultation? Well, you collect ideas from individuals, uh, and you, do that, you did that via survey, and we also had our information specialist look through the literature to find out what questions were, unanswered, what are, were needed to be answered from the research literature on cavernoma. And there's a whole range of places you can go to for that. Oops, a daisy. And uh, we did it over a whole range of issues, not just management and treatment, but as I say, diagnosis, prognosis, therapeutics, etiology, and so on. And we got 2,268 questions from the survey. We got 34 questions from the literature, 2,302 questions. And at the end of the day, we need 10. So how do you get from 2,302 to 10? And that was the part of the process called collation, uh, sifting or uh, formatting. And, uh, well, it was good because not all the questions we asked were unique. Many people asked the same question. Uh, I should say at the beginning of this that uh, we had a, a trustee board where we said, let's do the PSP. It's going to cost £25,000 to find the 10 best questions unknown in, uh, in uh, Cavanova. And one member of the board said, OK, I'll save you 25k, I'll write them down, 1 to 10, which he did. And he got the first one right, but he got the next nine wrong. So many people asked the same question. Uh, whoops, I seem to press this button too often. Uh, sorry about that. Let's try again. How do I, where do I point this to make it work? So, for example, are there any activities to be avoided? Can I leave a normal life? What activities should my daughter avoid at school if she had a cavernoma? They were all deemed to be, along with 130 other nine similar questions, collectible under the question, is there any evidence that specific physical activities can trigger cavernoma symptoms? So they weren't identical questions, but they were deemed to be, uh, they, they were deemed to fall under that one heading. And uh, then not all the questions were unique. Uh, sorry, that, not, not all questions were unknowns. And many, many patients or care, uh, carers asked questions about cavernoma and the clinicians said they know all about that, and so that got knocked out. And those knocked out questions we're producing as a, as a paper on our website, which will be all the answers you didn't know the answers to that clinicians tell us they do. And some questions weren't questions. I mean, some people just wanted to vent off, and some people said very sensible things, but they didn't happen to be questions. And so at the end of that period, we got 79 questions. So that took us from 2,302 down to 79. Then you have a level of prioritization to get to the final 10. And the long list was generated by the steering group. It took those 79 questions and asked whether any of them were really different. Uh, it asked whether they were out of scope. In other words, whether they, they weren't, they were proper questions for someone to ask, but they weren't relevant within the scope of our uh, uh, price setting partnership and so on. And that got us down uh, to, uh, oh dear, that got us down to uh, 54 then we had a short list of 54 questions. And we put out a survey to everybody who was prepared to answer the survey who had supplied questions in the first place. And so there were 54 questions, and they were, pe people were asked to rank them on a 1 to 5 scale. And then we used that 1 to 5 scale to reduce that short list down to, uh, uh, to, to, down to a short list. And then what we had was a one-day workshop that was run by JLA facilitators that took the questions from the shortlist to identify the, uh, the, the, the final 10. So we went to uh, 2,302 to 79 to 54. There were 29 questions. There were supposed to be 30 by the protocol, but two were deemed to be the same. And in the end, we got a short list of 10. In fact, what we did is we merged two sets of the 29 to make 27, and we published the 27 and the top 10. Now, you've got the top 10 on a little card here. Uh, so those are the top 10 questions that were asked. 
And they were a prioritized list from a workshop which included clinicians and patients and carers. There were 30 of us. And it was a genuinely fascinating day to see clinicians and patients talking together about whether question X was more important or not than question Y. So that is the basic process. Then, uh, the, uh, then they were entered onto the uh, database. They had to be prepared in what's known as PICO format. Uh, if you know about that, that's straightforward. But the questions had to refer to the patients, what the intervention was, what the comparison was. Uh, in our case, it would be, you know, like a placebo or whatever. And then what the outcome was going to be. And you had to identify the background, systematic reviews or whatever. And you had to identify the source of each question. That actually turned out to be a total mess because so many different people had asked the questions, both clinicians and patients, that it didn't really make sense uh, to, to do that. So what were the benefits to us as CA UK? What would the benefits be to you in your organisation? Well, first of all, of course, I prioritised a list of questions and the next step is to go out to the researchers in order to try and persuade them that they want to do that kind of research and go out to funders in order to do their research. And so where we are with that at the moment, we've got one application before the National Institutes of Health Research, uh, and that's being reviewed at the moment, and that's to do randomised control trials, which for the rare disease is very difficult, and it's going to be probably impossible to do a proper RCT on those. It's going to be a mixture uh, of that and observational studies. But it also gave us fantastic contacts with clinicians, because we had sent this out to clinicians from the Royal College of Neurosurgeons, from the British uh, Neurologists Association and other professional societies. Quite a lot of people answered that and we got to know about people in, in, uh, in hospitals around the country who have been an extremely useful resource to us, which we wouldn't have done otherwise. It enabled us to identify what patients wanted to know the answers to uh, and uh, it, it gave us a massive number of new opportunities. At the first, we thought 25k for doing this exercise was going to be just about worthwhile, but it's turned out to be brilliant. Uh, I think if you look at the list of questions, you would say, well, they're none of them terribly surprising. I mean, the first one almost spoke for itself. We wanted to know what the, uh, what the evidence was for the uh, two obvious treatments for cavernoma. The next one was to do with the cause and so on. You might say they're unsurprising, but nonetheless, they give us an opportunity to go out and, and uh, approach people uh, with them. And so uh, it's very nice of you, Flora, to invite us to this, because this has been a wonderful opportunity for us to meet other people and so on. But we're giving talks about this to quite a number of other places. I thought you might just be interested to know where the categories were. So the top ten, two of them only were treatment, two were cause, uh, none diagnosis, one was on self-management, uh, uh, and it was the most, one of the most popular questions asked. Uh, we had four on prognosis and one a general question. And then when you got to the top 27, you got a spread of questions. You then had a lot on treatment and so on. Uh, I put in two slides. Uh, our researchers, this is very much Heather's, uh, did rather better perhaps. I could slip over it, but there's blue sky research going to applied, going on to clinicals, to commercial organizations for drug development and uh, various types of research, which uh, Sarah covered anyway. So uh, you can read about this for Cavernoma on the Cavernoma website, slash PSP, very obviously, and there you will find the resource on how to run, or how we ran, a PSP. Uh, and with a lot of resource behind it, it gives the publications that we've had since. There was an article in Lancet of Neurology. Uh, there's been a nice Cochrane review, uh, and, and, and so on. And so uh, that's the end of, I think, what I was planning to say. <laughs>